Hello everyone. Today I want to speak about smart security for smart homes in the 5G era. My name is Armin Vasicek and I'm a research manager with Avast. Smart home security is an area of increasing concerns. As we put more and more devices into our homes, we also increase the attack surface of these homes at the same time. At Avast, we did some research to find out how many devices people are actually having in their home networks and what are the device types that people are using. So you find the results to the rest to the right in this pie chart. So we found that at least one third of the homes that we were looking at have five to 10 devices in their home network. 6% have even more, have even 10 or more devices in their home networks. The next question that we looked at was how many of these devices are actually vulnerable. So we found that 40% of these smart homes contain at least one device that's vulnerable to cyber attacks. Looking into what is kind of the most common attack vector here is we found that 69% are vulnerable to weak access credentials. So the weak access credential is when people don't reset their uh, default passwords or use weak passwords uh, themselves. The top vulnerable devices in the smart homes uh, are printers, network edge storages, and cameras. So all of these device types have in common that they are standalone devices. The interaction, the user interaction with them is very sparse, and they're always online. So they're always connected to the internet. They're always accessible. A device that has similar ca characteristics uh, is the home router. So we also found that home routers, 59% to be exact, have also weak access credential problems and also some other vulnerabilities. And there is a trend, this doesn't change. So we asked the users uh, how they maintain their routers and 59% of them responded that they have never logged into their home router nor have ever updated its firmware. So these problems are most likely not going to go away and they will stay for us uh, because the user don't want to resolve them. Another side, st a side story uh, in this are the media boxes, which is the next most prevalent IoT device, device, device category in smart homes. The connection to 5G here is that the European Union was freeing up the 700 megahertz spectrum for the radio access for the 5G. Uh, and this spectrum was occupied by the antenna TV. So, uh, people had to move on to the DVB-T2, uh, which for what they needed some set-top boxes. And these set-top boxes were manufactured, but unfortunately, because this was such a quick action, they have some vulnerabilities that some of our researchers discovered. So this is an example for a story how these vulnerabilities get introduced in the home networks. Something happens, devices come up, and uh, have to be employed and connected to the home networks. And then they sit there and they have the vulnerabilities. So next we were also looking at what is the geographic distribution of uh, vulnerable smart homes. And for example, the US uh, has 35% uh, of connected homes with at least one or more vulnerable devices. So the reason there is this spread uh, is depending on several factors. So we found that the prevalent device types are one uh, reason why some geographies are more have more vulnerable smart homes than others. So the, the mix of devices that people have in their homes is quite different. For example, Western countries tend to have more of the smart speakers, whereas uh, countries in the, in the East have more cameras on their home networks. Another, another reason is the supply chain. So many some devices are manufactured more cheaper, cheaper than others. So uh, the cheaper the device, typically, uh, the older the software, the older the chips, the older the firmware. So this is also kind of reason for devices to become more vulnerable. Uh, next, the ISP security culture is also an important factor. Some countries, uh, ISPs uh, take great pride in securing the networks for the consumers, but in others, uh, uh, ISPs don't care that much. And finally, it's also important what are the other devices on the home network. What typically happens is if after one device gets infected, ethicists try to do a lateral move and find other 
vulnerable devices in the same home network. So looking at the type of malware that, that is common for IoTs, it all started out with the Mirai infections uh, and which produced these super large botnets for DDoSing. So this was a very early IoT malware. It just had a single purpose, DDoSing, crypto mining, and, but it could be easily spotted and stopped. So what then happened was that the authors of the Mirai uh, open sourced the source code. So there's now this code base has been reused and uh, rewritten and evolved over time. This led to more sophisticated malware types like the Tori, or at the moment we have the Kaiji malware going around and finding vulnerable hosts. The difference here is that this malware has evolved. It's now more persistent, so it's harder to remove. Uh, it tries more obfuscation techniques to hide itself from detection. It has extended the range of the malware that it actually can deliver, and uh, it gathers more information from the, from the networks. So there is a trend of getting more sophisticated malware out there for malware authors. And uh, it's actually a quite a, a crowded area for malware authors to find a vulnerable IoT devices. So they are competing with each other to infect smart homes. Okay, so let's find, let's try to find about a solution. So starting with the manufacturers, is they, uh, they, should, uh, they should secure the devices that they deliver. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. So securing IoT devices on the device level doesn't seem to be feasible for some very simple reasons. First, the consumer electronics, which is the category of IoT devices in consumer space has very low profit margins. So since there is, it's very competitive, uh, people are very reluctant to add the chip that's needed for security or the software stack that does the security. So this is all very cost driven. Time to market is of essence. So it's kind of very hard to add the security capabilities even though they would be needed. Another factor is that IoT manufacturers might not always have the security expertise that's required to build a secure device. So this is very deep knowledge that you have to have to build all the secure boot and the secure uh, device authentication methods into the firmware. Also, IoT devices lack the hardware resources to run a security workload. So unlike your PC or your mobile phone, where enough resources are there, where you can actually install an endpoint security solution, IoT devices might not even have the management interface so that you can access and add uh, software to the device. So what remains is that the IoT security has to work on the network level. So the network is the unifying element in the smart home. All devices are at some point on the network. Just as a definition of an IoT device, it's connected. It connects to the internet, it connects to the public cloud to deliver its service. So for that reason, it has to become part of some form of the home network, either the home Wi-Fi, or maybe it has a modem for 5G or an LTE connection. So being on the network, we can detect accesses to malicious URLs in the web. We can also see what kind of behavior the device is exposing on the network. So we can detect behavior changes and we can also see if a device is, is installing some hidden channels, if it's using some hidden channels. By that we mean it's using a, its app using a regular protocol in a malicious way to hide information. We can also react to these threats on the network by restricting network access of IoT devices. Even though they have no management interface where we can just uh, turn them off, we can do so on the network by implementing security policies on the network. And uh, inevitably, some of the devices will become infected at certain points in time. So what's also important here then, what we can do on the network, we can protect protect the rest of the network from compromised devices. So as they increased, as we use increasingly IoT devices in our smart homes, and the prediction here is that this devices, the number of devices is gonna triple to uh, 75, billion, 75 billion connected things, uh, they, we need more protection. Manufacturers are under time and cost pressure so they cannot deliver the security that's often needed for the devices. 
So the bottom line is someone else, operators need to step up on smart home security. So operators are currently busy with implementing the 5G. So 5G uh, will accelerate the IoT trends that we see right now. So one of the big pillars of 5G is the enhanced mobile broadband. This is coming to the consumer home in the form, for example, of fixed wireless access. So this is one of the first services for, that's going to be launched on 5G, for example, to connect rural areas or densely populated multi-dwelling units, etc. So the promise of the enhanced mobile broadband is uh, significantly faster data speeds and greater capacity. So when you increase the data speed and the bandwidth that's available for each home, at the same time, you also increase the potential for, for DDoS attacks, for example, and other types of attacks. Also, if there are more devices that can be now onboarded on home networks, there are more uh, vulnerable devices that are potential, put, there are more potentially vulnerable devices that att attackers can use. So this is, uh, this is the trend that's emerging with 5G and IoT. Uh, the key 5G needs is for it to realize its value proposition, propositions, the network virtualization, and also open networking platforms. This is one of, these are two of the big pillars that are re prerequisites to implement 5G in a, in a sustainable manner. So this virtual, this network virtualization and this virtual network uh, networking enables the mobile edge computing. So which can be seen as an extension of the home network in the operator cloud. And this is a very important point because at the same time that 5G accelerates these uh, trends of having more IT devices, having a bigger attack surface, it also offers a solution because through this virtual networking, we can introduce new network functions that help us doing the security. So we can introduce new services faster and more dynamic uh, than before. We can help by developing uh, security functions on the network edge to secure mobile homes. Okay, let's take a step back and look at what's actually going on when uh, smart homes are being attacked. So here, this is an example of a botnet attack. So we have like uh, three, 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 device, three types of devices here. So there's this infected device that's under the control of the bot master. This is the guy to the right, who's controlling the, the command and control server. So this bot master will instruct the infected device to attack the victim device by brute forcing, for example. So if there is big credentials, then a brute force attack is very likely to be successful. Another way would also be <clears throat> to steal the credentials and use the steal, stolen credentials to uh, get shell access on the victim device. After this level of access has been established, the next thing is that the victim device will receive instructions, uh, for example, via some hidden channel uh, to download malware. So this is then the actual binary. This is the actual file that contains the, uh, the bad actions. So the victim device then will go ahead and carry out whatever the bot master tells it, for example, DDoSing, spamming, crypto mining, or any other form of um, malicious action. What's here very interesting is that uh, these bot masters, the attackers, they are most often part of a criminal organization. So this has been a change from the hacker at home in his garage. Now the actors that we see are criminal organizations that make a business out of offering botnets for rent. So you can go online, you can book your botnet, you can determine, do you want to DDoS, do you want to spam, uh, whatever is kind of the thing that people want. You can hire uh, a botnet, 1,000 nodes, 10,000 nodes, different geographies to execute your uh, malicious actions. The business model is very much very similar to, to, to a cloud model. So when you go to a cloud, you book an instance, you start the instance, run the workload, and then you get built. Same for botnets. You go online, you book a botnet, you run your malicious workload, and then you get built by the criminal organization. And as the botnets have to live on, 
uh, in a third step, uh, the attackers seek to extend and maintain the post the, the posture that they have, the position, maintain the uh, posture that they have in the network, and to go out and look for the next vulnerable device, either on the internet or even in the local home network, by scanning for vulnerabilities. So Market Watch uh, has this prediction about the global botnet detection market, uh, which is very interesting. It's uh, expected to grow tremendously by 37.6% uh, during the forecast period, which is uh, like three years. So in return, this also means that the, uh, the, the threat through botnets is also on, will also increase over time uh, in the future. All right, so now we've, we took a look at how an attack would look like. Let's see how we can uh, defend against such an attack. So it's a similar net setup between devices uh, and the, the botnet command and control. And what you really want, you want to protect the victim device by drawing a security fence around the home network. So on the network level. So what you do is you collect some statistics from the home. So what's also helpful is that the virtualization of the network, the extension of the home network in the edge cloud increases the visibility of the traffic. So it becomes easier uh, and uh, with more visibility, it becomes, uh, the data becomes better uh, than in current setups to collect the statistics that are then in the next step uh, put as a security workload, as an analytics, security analytics workload at the edge. Here it's crucial that it's as close, that the spatial proximity is as close as possible to where the data is generated to the smart home. Often there is a race between the attacker and the defender going on. So for example, think about when the attacker tries to download the malware. So there is an HTTP request going out and then there is an HTTP response which starts the download. So the outgoing HTTP request has to be checked and a verdict, if it's a good request or a bad request, has to be delivered before the HTTP response comes back to guarantee that the user doesn't see or doesn't feel any difference in the processing. So this is why we want to be as close. This is why we want to have short latencies to basically not have any impact on the user experience, which is very important uh, when doing this kind of service. In the third step, after the decision has been made, if the network traffic is good or bad, you can block uh, the flows uh, very close to the edge. And this is done by using the form of a virtual network function. And this is basically what we are suggesting here. So we are suggesting here to put the security workload, the security analytics workload as a network function on the edge. So looking at this diagram, on the left-hand side, we have the user domain, where is the smart home network. And inside the smart home network, we have all these IoT devices. They can have 5G, they can have Wi-Fi, they can be wirebound. They all connect to the operator domain. And uh, in the operator domain, we have this mobile edge cloud, for example, running on the central office. And inside this mobile edge cloud, we have a security network function that protects, that gets the statistics, uh, computes the, does the analyt, analytics and computes uh, decisions for the smart home. A very important link here is upstream the threat intelligence cloud. So this is a very important piece because uh, the threat landscape changes all the time. So this is a very important operation to keep track of what are the current threats, what are the current scanners, who is scanning the internet for vulnerabilities, what kind of vulnerabilities is scanned for, what, are the, what is the current malware, what is the development of, the, of these malware families, uh, what's going to be infected, and maybe even do predictions, what's going to be infected next. These are our old services that the Threat Intelligence Cloud would deliver. <clears throat> and the Threat Intelligence Cloud will deliver this information to the smart home security network function so that it can do its processing. So the relation between the VNF and the threat intelligence cloud is similar to what a music player does at the music. So the music player is the mechanism that puts, uh, that, that makes the music audible, whereas the music is the content. This is 
what you want to hear. That is what you uh, enjoy to hear. Um, yes, yeah, so there are two other boxes. There's the upstream in this diagram. So if the traffic is checked and it's passed it, then it can go upstream to the internet. And then there's also a management interface for the lifecycle management of the virtual network function. And this is also a very important piece uh, because uh, subscribers should be able to transparently join the service or turn out of the service. So whenever one of these actions, one of these triggers happens, then with, uh, with the proper automation, the network functions is added to the data pass or removed from the data pass on behalf of the user. Okay, so, so wrapping this up, uh, let's look at what kind of value this system could create uh, in the emerging uh, edge ecosystem. So the value for the user is quite obvious. So it's protection from, sp from threats and specifically protection from threats specifically aimed at smart homes. It's also very important that this uh, is, happens through a zero provisioning, zero, sorry, zero touch provisioning approach. This is important so that the user can basically do it as a convenience by using a web interface or the smartphone uh, or not even doing anything at all. And this is done automatically because it's, for example, bundled with a connectivity package. So it's very convenient for the user and the user doesn't take any responsibility in installing a device or installing some software on a device. Uh, the cloud native software piece is also very important because uh, this being cloud native and being agile, the software function can be updated on demand. So when new threats emerge or when new functionality is required, this can be rolled out very fastly. Uh, it's a cloud system, so the updates are very convenient for the operators. Finally, the usage is transparent uh, across all devices in the smart home. So because everything happens through the network, when you add devices to the network, they are automatically protected just by being on the network. All the traffic is going to be checked. So all devices are going to be checked and uh, assured that they, are not, uh, that they are not being infected. The value creation for operators uh, is also very interesting. So to the right, I uh, put in a picture uh, from, uh, from a consulting paper that several uh, operators did, where they analyzed what is kind of the impact of this uh, emerging edge. And this graph speaks to the business opportunities that come out there. So this is a, a shorter version of the graph that displays the top five business opportunities in addition to traditional telecom products. And one of them uh, is actually the business to consumer security services. So similar services that I proposed here uh, with the IRT protection for smart homes. So what can operators gain here? Operators can create additional revenue streams through offering security services to the users by bundling connectivity and security at the same time for their users. This is like just from a business perspective, from an operational perspective, what's also very interesting, we spoke about the uh, protection, the virtual network function being close to the edge, being in close proximity to the smart home. So we can basically stop the threats immediately after they arise. So even though a device is infected and would produce some DDoS traffic, we can stop it right at the edge. In that way, no additional cost through the DDoS traffic uh, is caused. So this kind of saves uh, the operator uh, some um, operational cost in terms of uh, not have, having to route unnecessary traffic. And finally, also very important uh, is that uh, offering security to the users uh, increases the subscriber trust in the operator brand. With this, I want to close. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm available on the chat. Thank you. Hello, we've opened up the phone bridge. So uh, if you have any questions for Amin, you can put them in the Q&A chat and he will be able to answer those for you. Once again, if you have any questions for Armin, you can put them in the Q&A chat and he can answer those for you. Yeah, thanks again, everyone, for, for watching.
Thanks again for joining me for the presentation. Now is a good time to ask questions. So if we don't have any questions at the moment, I think there's also the opportunity in the in the Slack channel. So if you haven't joined the Slack yet, uh, then uh, yeah, thanks for the webcast. Uh, I will be available in the Slack channel as well for, for future questions. Um, thank you. Ah, there's a question. What? Sorry, uh, Prakash had a question, but I think you didn't finish typing. Could you repeat the question again? Armin, the second half of this question actually is in the regular chat. It's how will you support upstream security for IoT devices that are not managed? Oh, thank you. Um, so the upstream security is actually what we propose is this virtual network function that is actually the upstream security. So you have a device that sits in your home. It's connected through your ISP, through your operator, and then upstream in the mobile edge cloud there's a security function. So the IoT device itself is unmanaged from the point of view of the operator. It's just, it could be a doorbell, you unpack it, you connect it to your Wi-Fi network, and the traffic passes through the edge where the traffic is going to be checked, and then it's continuing on, on the data pass to the cloud or to the internet, wherever it needs to go. So this is kind of the value proposition of being on the network. Uh, you don't have to manage devices. You look at the network traffic and then take decisions about the security. Oh, and just thinking about it, if you say, um, well, it is end-to-end -end security. So the question was like, is the end-to-end -end security therefore not guaranteed? Yes, it is, it is guaranteed because like the connection, so the connection between the device and its cloud, this is what's the end-to-end -end, and we check on the end, -to we check this connection. So yes, there is an end-to-end -end security component to that, but there is no security stack on the device and there's no security stack on the endpoint. So this is what, what like this end-to-end -end security guarantee would entail. This would be a step, need to be established by the manufacturer. Being a third party, by looking at the traffic, you can check that the end-to-end -end connections, that they are secure, that they are not misbehaving. Uh, so this is the end-to-end -end guarantee that you can do using this uh, security analytics approach. Okay, it looks like we are at time. Um, I had put it in the broadcast. I'll broadcast it again. But if you want to continue the conversation, you can uh, do so on the Slack channel. Uh, the Slack channel name is number two, Business IoT Edge. Once again, that's number two, Business IoT Edge. Uh, please feel free to continue any questions or discussion that you might want on that Slack channel. Thank you very much. Thank you.